Thank you, everybody. Uh, we'll do a bit of housekeeping first before getting into it, starting with uh, what is 702 AI. And I moved here to Las Vegas, and so I moved business with me, located at 801 South Main Street, right up the block. Uh, ChatGPT, your entire firm's data. The reality of the hardware, a single box that fits in the office of any law firm or insurance firm or anyone who might have data as a part of their day-to-day -day business. And with that, there are all sorts of bits of open source software that have been developed since ChatGPT has come out that are available that allow not only the prompts, but the whole of the model to run locally and to give you responses on not just a single file like you might with ChatGPT, but your entire business's entire history of data. It takes a bit of setup, maintenance, and so on if you're buy curious or ready to buy. And that is 702 AI. And now on to more interesting things about AI chatbots. So as far as it goes, I was born and raised on the internet. I'm an engineer and an entrepreneur. Uh, understanding where we're at, I think it's important to understand how we got here. Who here had Yahoo as their first search engine? A few. And a few of you could look back to then, and I'll start there with how it was made. People at computers looking at web pages as they became known to them and then putting them into a category. If you had a page about a chicken sandwich, that goes into the food category. When Tyson Chicken comes knocking to advertise, a person says, we've got a whole food category for you. We'll put it there. And it's all manual categorization and it's manual placement at a page level. We look at the whole page, we put it in a category. That's in the early 90s, and along comes Google. Sergey Brin, Larry Page, the founders, are PhDs, and they come up with something called PageRank. And whether PageRank has to do with pages or Larry Page, you can guess. What it does is it bases the connections between pages at a lower level than a page. It does it at the link level. All these people who were at Yahoo were going page by page, and the guys at Google did some math, and they said, if a page has a link, let's see where does that link lead to. So if there's a link leading to the chicken sandwich page, that's good. And if there's 100 of them, that's better than the one that only has 50. And in that way, they were able to rank, when you type in chicken sandwich, according to which has the most inbound links. The concept in computer science is homophily. But really, it's just birds of a feather flock together. Mm -hmm. If there's these similar pages that are linked to you, that is proof positive for the math to say, well, this is relevant to people. And at the end of the day, it is people that are making the links. It's not so much the math that's so brilliant. It's that people are naturally doing these things because they're building web pages. And if I'm building a web page and I think that that chicken sandwich page is good, rather than remake it myself, I link to the other one. In the late 90s, the web is being crawled daily by Google. Anytime they can get from one link, they go to another one. If you were a webmaster then, you might try to submit your site to get indexed by Google. It was a good thing and it was nice. And on the back of that same math, Amazon was able to do similar things with shopping. They are able to take people's purchase habits and say, they bought all of this stuff and somebody's now searching for this one thing. Well, that person will probably like that other stuff too. And it's the same concept of the behavior of people coming into a math model and then being output in a way that you can build the business off of. The business side for Google was on using a similar technology to instead of Tyson Chicken saying, we'll put you in the food category. It's not so simple as that. We'll give you a bid on an ad spot and when something relevant comes up that matches yours, your bid will go and will get paid on some percentage of what you put in. 
Warren Buffett once lamented that he didn't invest in Google because he was spending $12 per ad for Geico when there's no incremental cost to it. It's a good business and Google is now entrenched as one of the largest companies on the planet. Fast forward from the late 90s to the late aughts and we get Facebook. And the reason Facebook did better than MySpace or Friendster or any of the other ones that came before it is not so much to do with the genius of Mark Zuckerberg as to do with the cost of uploading photos. At that time, the price got so low and cameras became so ubiquitous, anybody could do it. And it's that same math again, that as you're on Facebook and you're uploading your photos and also putting in your interests in a way that can be mathed, they can be ranked. And if your interests are the same as your friends and that friend posts something, that'll go to the top of your feed. And if you like it, that's another proof positive to then put more stuff like that. Fast forward to every other company that we all know today having a similar style of feed and we can realize that that basic equation of connecting things on a link level went really far and it built the web as we know it. I have these slides because there's an audience in front of me and I've been giving this to friends the last few days in a one-on-one -on -one setting. So uh, part of what's up here is basically tracking what I'm saying, but there might be some divergences. The final piece of it, you get into about 2015, Google's got all the money in the world, so do some of these other companies, and they've got a gazillion dollars to do what you might think a research institution would do. Fundamental research on new math that ultimately may or may not make money, but it's a part, it's a part of the future of the business. And in 2015, a paper comes out called the unreasonable effectiveness of character level transforms. What it means is they're starting to go from like a link, which is very explicit. If you've ever built a web page, you mark a link and you do it with a markup language that any computer can read and also people can and then visual processors can put out those links in a way that we all recognize. It's cool and it's definitely cooler than page level categorization. So a character, we all know, if we have a word Yahoo, Y is a character, A is a character, H, O, O, that's, that's all characters. And we all know what words are, and word is Yahoo, and Google, and links, and Bing, and all of these. But a token is the size that the large language models that we talk about, like ChatGPT, are running on. And that's a subword piece. That's like the Y-A-H and the O-O in Google. And for an engineer like me, that's what I'm billed by. When I'm doing prompting at the API level, I'm getting billed by how many tokens there are. And it's a heuristic. It's not always easy to know ahead of time. It's not one word and all of that. But we get down the line from Yahoo to Bing. And the only way that that's possible to get that token level resolution is a lot of human activity. In the time that we've been using the web as a population of Earth, we've all been on Reddit and we've been on Tumblr and we've been on all of the places where the data that the companies have been selling to other companies has been done pragmatically using computers. And there's these simple interchange formats that any engineer works with that they're able to source from one place and then send to another. And that's how when you want to use some type of social broadcast tool, you can upload to Hootsuite and it goes out to the other ones. Along comes this math in 2015 and 2017, and some folks are starting to realize the more data we give it, the more incredible the results. So it's the middle of the plague, and I'm on a phone call with another entrepreneur who's saying, I got access because I was part of Y Combinator to something called ChatGPT, pardon me, he said GPT-3 at the time. He had access to this beta, and he thought it was cool. He was using it for some company in Ohio to be able to give better legal advice. It wasn't quite there, but he was being paid to do it and he thought it was promising. And GPT-2, GPT-3, 3.5, and 4, they're fundamentally on the idea of let's look at token level understanding of the web. As much data as we can do, let's label as much of it as we can. In some ways, we can rely on the public that's already labeled a lot of this stuff for us. We can rely on researchers that have done some things for image recognition, we can rely on, okay, and we can do all of that, and then we can go further with our own people. These are some Silicon Valley folks, they're well-funded to the degree that 
to spend a hundred million dollars in something, like let's just label a lot of data so we can feed it into the machine, is very, very plausible. So they do that. And that's how we got to here today. We're at the third, maybe, if you want to look at it in the way that I've drawn it, but it's really just a continuum of we, society, are all just putting stuff up there and some nerds on computers are trying to categorize it all. And they've gotten very good at it. And now that we have ChatGPT, we've gotten maybe scary good at it. I mean, it's getting to be where there's thoughts about AI today that a uh, general populace might be afraid of. And I think it's important to address it at uh, society. How is it that we look at it? And I've got it listed as the public, in business and the arts. And I'll just go one by one through them. If you watched the Senate hearing where Sam Altman, an executive from IBM and a uh, AI researcher were in front of the Senate Judiciary Committee, the senators of our country here are basically concerned about three things. Is this gonna kill us? Is it gonna harm our children? And will it steal from us? In reverse order, will it steal from us? Tennessee senator who's representing Nashville is concerned we can use AI to generate something that sounds like Garth Brooks. How could we do that? Well, probably we put in a bunch of Garth Brooks songs and now we can spit it back out with a little bent. Now, as far as my anecdotal evidence of asking artists, artists love this. It's a very creatively powerful, empowering device. But rights holders who have to make money off the artists are freaking out a bit. How can they make money Sam Altman and the others basically just said, we haven't figured out how to pay the artist yet. In all likeliness, the artists are going to get robbed, like they did from the beginning of time, and they'll still make music because they like making it. Some of them will get very rich, but it won't stop anybody very poor from picking up a guitar and playing it. I don't think we have to worry about the death of creativity because we have to figure out a new way to monetize it. Uh, my father owned retail CD stores, so Around the 90s, all of them went out of business as a result of Napster and his punk son at home, like uploading ripped CDs for downloads and torrents and wares. And at 12 years old, I didn't know what I was doing. But another thing that could be said is, why didn't he innovate? My own pop, couldn't he see the internet coming? Well, waves come and they wipe out a whole lot of people. Even the best record stores like Tower went out of business. If you look at what happens in creativity, there are these waves that come along and it change everything. You've got to live with it. And at the end of this presentation, I'll be happy to take questions and comments. I see the hand in the audience, but I'd like to get next into firms, businesses. And a part of my work this year has been working with a law firm on some new software that's going to connect from their customer's phone all the way into their deep databases so that if they get injured in an accident and they've hired this law firm, they can report their pain scores and it's a fairly pro forma application. I'm happy to do it. It's a good customer. It's here and local. And then this chief executive officer, the guy who's responsible for funding my work, said, look into ChatGPT. And for a moment there, I thought my job for the remainder of the year would be to get half of this team fired because I would be able to replace some of the roles that look like data entry with something a little bit more automated. It passed pretty fast because I realized the only way these models work today that we are all so impressed by is on the back of a massive amount of data labeling. The only way this works is if we can identify some abstract concept in a very concrete way, often by hand by somebody saying, here's a picture of a dog, and then we label that thing dog. Or if there's a bigger scene, we say, in the scene, here's the dog, here's the lamp, here's the couch. And now we've got a more complex model that can do multi-image identification. And on the words, it's the same. We can talk about the mapping between different languages. There's got to be some understanding of everybody in the audience that GPT is scary good in English. Uh, really, it isn't much in the language spoken on the Isle of Man that's going extinct. It's not very good in languages that it doesn't have a lot of data for. It's mostly a sense of size. I don't think that firms really are in a position to lay off people because there are too many other firms that are using this technology 
and it's like an all hands on deck to move people's skill sets from one style of data entry into a database to another style of data entry, which is into a data labeled pool that can ultimately feed into a model to feed back better results. And the best one is the Senate. Sam Altman, he goes to Washington, and the first senator asks about music. And then the next one is asking about our children. And we all have that same fear. Sam's response is, we keep adult content out of ChatGPT. We do it because the only authentication we do is a checkbox that says you're over 13. And every one of us can agree, you don't want anything sexual in front of your children, and so we can just say there's nothing inherently wrong with it. Some of us in here are sex workers, and we're all comfortable knowing at the end of the day, as adults, it's out there, and it's a part of the world. But we don't want our children having it. So fine, ChatGPT can't do that. What you also lose is the ability to generate a Quentin Tarantino movie. <laughs> you, we can all appreciate the artistic of any maybe violent fantasy as a way to express something about society, you would lose that. You would also lose anything that's uh, righteously funny. It's all offensive unless you like comedy. So you have to realize with ChatGPT, it's one model and it's very public and it's very broad and it has a relationship which is to say, we need to make it available to as many people, there are some restrictions on it and it seems like an okay thing by me. The final, Lindsey Graham is asking about can we program these things such that our drones could pick targets and kill them? And Sam says, yeah. And then the conversation moves on without any further comment. Now think about it as you all understand computers as business owners and general members of a digitized country. It's been possible to do exactly that with previous technology and we haven't. We have decisions to make about how we use our technology and it's been proven out time and time again that we're happy to have AI agents and no problem with a phone tree that if, even if we're annoyed by it, it's lowering the cost and we can get a cheaper flight. But we don't give them agency and we haven't yet. We don't give them the decision making capability that still lay ultimately down the line with a human at some level. You can get to a human after an AI phone tree, no matter what. I'm going to pause there on a philosophical rhetorical thing called Burke's Pentad. There's five pieces of this thing. Agency, actor, action, setting, and purpose. And if we look at all those five, and we can understand that any one point can connect to all the others, you can analyze the human drama. You can look at any situation, there's always people in it, they're in a place, there's a purpose to being there, and what role do we want AI to play in that? It's been determined, probably we don't want phones in church, so yeah, that's not right setting for AI. If you looked at it as simple geographic setting. But an agent, we're, we're down for that. If we're all playing Dungeons and Dragons and we said, hey, AI, give us some purpose to this setting and be our dungeon master, maybe it'll work there too. But from parts of pleasure and business and responsibility of all kinds, agency isn't one of them. So the senators all have to do their jobs. They're part of a big public broadcast and answer and ask about the most broad generic things and we can all get down with concern for our children uh, concern for our jobs and livelihoods and the livelihoods of our constituents and our neighbors and of course the lives and deaths of our citizens and fellow men. So I'm going to get more into the firm side of things with how can anybody get started with any of this beyond the prompt because it matters to me as an engineer much more how it works, how to build with it than necessarily operate with a user interface. I believe that it matters to everybody else too. If this is some of the stuff that everybody on my team from the uh, generative AI artist who did his project to get on John Oliver and thought, wow, this is cool, he is no longer impressed by stable diffusion and wants to go deeper and run it himself. And then the law firm that's hired me for this one is curious about, well, what can we do more? How can we get a competitive edge if everybody has ChatGPT? So, you can buy hardware, it 
took billions of dollars in investment and research to make these models that now can live on about 30 gigabytes, which is more, maybe, maybe, there's one person in here who has a phone with less than 30 gigabyte hard drive, it's from like a while ago. But basically all the phones in this room are gonna be 64 and up. You can fit that much data on a phone. You need more processing power than the normal computer. You need some GPUs to do it. But people are running toys on their laptop and if you go a little bit further, you can get a real business tool out of it. You buy your hardware, your software, you can build with it. A locked door makes like a promise that it is the way to get into the secured area. And when IBM and OpenAI and the professor from Columbia all go in front of the Senate, and the senators are all, how do we regulate you guys, you big entities? They miss the point, which is that this is all based on publicly available math. And already engineers are gone in the side window and said, yeah, forget all your whatevers, we're gonna do what we want with it. And it's a very creative thing that is very accessible and it doesn't have the gatekeeper like maybe Google or Facebook or some of the massive things out of the era that we all sort of came to think, well, Silicon Valley sucks a little bit. I mean, it was nice to have pictures of my grandma and all that, but like you sold all my data out the back door and now it's a big problem. Or we keep saying this is harmful to our children and you keep just feeding it to them. And so they don't really change their behavior. Why would they? Because the whole world continues to use it. This is a different thing where the whole of the web, the distillation of it can fit onto one of these computers and then you can go further with it. If you're a law firm, I keep using that example. My whole work this year has been for the first time on a law firm. You have a few roles in your business like a receptionist all the way up to the lawyer who's got his name on the front door. And you have to understand that that receptionist has a role that's incidental to computers. She's not there for the computer, she's there for answering the call and then that goes into the computer at the end of the call to say to the lawyer, this relates to your case, you got a call about that. And then the lawyer, she calls back and says, yeah, okay, I see the notes here from the receptionist. And all of a sudden, the both of them have made a communication that's meaningful and the computer is only the incidental connector. It's like that. It's going to be a matter of an organization having software that takes that incidental computer interaction in a better direction than just a database into a more modern 2023 system. And then you've got to have data to label. When we talk about a law firm that has maybe one receptionist that goes to maybe 12 caseworkers and then they have maybe four paralegals and it looks a little pyramidic and those caseworkers, they're there to do work day in, day out. It's somewhat repetitive. It's basically a solid job that they can get in and out of and rely on and maybe they want to make a career of it and get promoted or not. And that is a level at which anybody can believe it is possible to learn how to work with models in the same way that they learn how to work with any enterprise software, any content management system, any CRM, all of it, it's very plausible. So you put your IT people on getting some hardware, your software gals on building something cool, and all the people in the firm get involved with data. So at the end of it, this little proverb here about memory is meaningful because We've written it all down in so many ways over decades in the web that it can feel like, wow, where is this all going? It was all done in secret. Most of the data in ChatGPT is from 2021. You can't get your local news in there and it takes a massive amount of investment to build the next one. And so there's a certain thing where it's paused at a moment in time and especially at the scale of the web. But as a smaller firm, as an organization, as a creative artist studio, or even just your local neighborhood newspaper, you can be a bit more adaptive to today because what you're dealing with is not indexing the entire planet. You've got some version of that available in open source, will land. It's that augmented with your firm's stuff, which is moving faster, but it's at a smaller size and you can retrain more often, keep up to date. So you don't have to remember it all, you just keep feeding it and then occasionally refresh. And I like this stuff, if there's any questions I can help you get started. It's really been a fun thing to learn about on my end and I keep learning more. So if that's 
all I think I have to say. I'm going to say thank you to Elizabeth for hosting me and more broadly to Josh Levitt for hosting this whole event and uh, to all of you here for uh, entertaining the idea that this is worth listening to. Thank you.